how do we bring in this rich, robust literature that's in these other disciplines? And we could think of nobody better than, than a preeminent scholar, a pioneer literally in, in the field of the work of psychology uh, and religion. Uh, Dr. Ken Fargeman is a professor emeritus of psychology at Bowling Green State University. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor at the Baylor Medical College. He's authored The Psychology of Religion and Coping and Spirituality, Integrated Psychotherapy. He's the editor in chief of a two volume APA handbook of psychology, religion, and spirituality. With Julie Exline, he's authored the recently released Working with Spiritual Struggles in Psychotherapy from Research to Practice. He was Distinguished Scholar at the Institute for Spirituality and Health at the Texas Medical Center. Uh, his awards go on and on and on. Uh, but let me just highlight the, the, the last point of this. He was recently named one of the 50 most influential living psychologists. So it is absolutely our joy to introduce to you uh, our keynote speaker today, Dr. Ken Parchman. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, I'm just delighted to be here. Um, before I get started, let me do the inevitable share screen, and we hope this will be okay. That's always a relief. So thank you very much. Um, first, I do want to thank um, the John Templeton Foundation for their uh, really inspirational leadership and support that's helped to advance this field. I also always thank my wonderful collaborators graduate students, uh, colleagues in the US and abroad. Um, no one can really be expert in everything it takes to do research in the domain of religion and spirituality. So we need to pool our resources. And I strongly encourage people to work together in teams, even if you can find only one or, other, one or two other people who share some interest by working together, we really multiply our resources and we, we multiply the sense of excitement and the support we need to move forward. So this morning, I'd like to discuss advances in the psychology of religion and spirituality over the past 50 years. I'm old enough now that I can talk about having worked in this area for almost 50 years. And I'd like to consider some of the implications of the findings for integration of religion and entrepreneurship. Um, let me admit from the outset that I'm a clinical psychologist of religion. Uh, I have little experience as an entrepreneur, but I have been fortunate to be at Bowling Green State University, which has one of the uh, top industrial organizational psychology programs in the country, and have been able to work with industrial organizational uh, faculty and graduate students over the years. Uh, we've done things like develop a congregation satisfaction scale, a uh, church climate scale. Uh, we developed a database consultation program for uh, religious institutions to help foster their effectiveness. So we have a little experience, but we certainly could have taken it further. And I only wish I had some of you uh, back then to collaborate with, because I, I think we could have really disseminated this type of work more broadly. Anyway, um, you are the experts on entrepreneurship and faith, uh, not me, but I applaud your interests and think it's really an exciting direction for the field. So here's what I have in mind this morning in this talk. I'd like to talk about um, some uh, of the evolutionary background to the field. And I'm gonna talk about uh, religious and spiritual resources and uh, how they may enhance human functioning. But I'm also going to talk about the flip side, religious and spiritual struggles. And one of the themes is that religion is really double-sided. It has the potential to enhance human functioning, but it also has the capacity to make matters worse. And, and we're going to talk about that. And what does that mean for our efforts to move forward? I want to talk a little bit about uh, a, a new area in this, this whole air field, and that's uh, the notion of wholeness. Wholeness is a, a psycho-spiritual construct. Get that psycho-spiritual, not psychotic spiritual, but psycho-spiritual. Um, and I think it offers a valuable way to think about the kind of integration that we're talking about here. 
So my hope is this will stimulate uh, more thoughts on your part about religion and spirituality and its implications for entrepreneurship. Okay, so that's the plan. Some history, uh, as, as Brett suggested, um, it's important to note that the founding figures in the field of psychology, William James, uh, G. Stanley Hall, James Luba, they were fascinated by religious phenomena uh, and they believed they were the heart and soul of the field of psychology, psychology, the study of the psyche. Um, but in its efforts to establish itself as a, as a scientific field, um, subsequent figures from uh, Sigmund Freud to B.F. Skinner um, tried to distance themselves from anything that hinted of superstition or magic. Listen, for example, to how Freud described religion. He said religion works by distorting the picture of the real world and delusional matter, by forcibly fixing adherents in a state of psychical infantilism, and by drawing them into a mass delusion. As brilliant as he was, Freud had some issues when it came to religion. <clears throat> but as a result of this anti-religious sentiment, the psychology of religion experienced a period of dormancy in the second quarter of the 20th century. But in the middle of the 20th century, a positive mental health movement emerged that began to question this antipathy. And it set the stage for the first wave of religious study in the third quarter of the 20th century. The focus of this wave was on demonstrating that there's a connection between religion and human functioning. And um, the, this, as important as it was, this wave of research did have some limitations. It relied on correlational designs, and which didn't really offer much insight into the impact of religion on health and well being. It relied on general measures of religion like denomination, or are you committed religiously, or how often do you attend a congregation? How often do you pray? <clears throat> but the knowledge gained from this research really didn't tell us much about religion. After all, people can pray for a variety of reasons. They can attend a congregation for many reasons. And these global measures provide only a kind of uh, distant perspective on religious life. And it, it seemed as though researchers were tiptoeing around religion, walking very carefully, which I think they actually were. This was, after all, some very new stuff. The question remained then, what is it about religion that explains the connections with human functioning? And the theories that dealt with the question were largely reductionistic. Um, they suggested that it really wasn't about anything religious at all that determined its effects. These effects could be understood in terms of presumably more basic psychological and social functions. So Freud maintained that religion served the purposes of anxiety reduction and impulse control. Um, sociologist Emile Durkheim said that religion was really all about social solidarity and identity. Anthropologist Clifford Geert said that religion is all about meaning making. He said that religion ensures that all the greatest problems of the world from suffering to injustice are not ultimately incomprehensible. Now, as valuable as these explanations were, none really considered the possibility that religion might serve a distinctive function in people's lives. These explanations seem to be more a way of explaining religion away than accounting for its special place in human life. A final limitation of wave one research was that it really said little to practitioners. Um, knowing that a, a church attendance is associated with life satisfaction at the 0.20 level, really what value does that have? And I should add that, uh, at least in a, a brief review I did of some of the research on faith and entrepreneurship, a study by Block, he did a review of 270 uh, studies in the area, and he also found that religion was most often operationalized by uh, these global measures. But in spite of the limitations of wave one research, it did serve a valuable purpose. Um, it demonstrated that there was a connection 
between religion and other aspects of how we function. In a review of over 1,200 studies in 2002 in the Handbook of Religion and Health, a psychiatrist Harold Koenig found that religious measures, largely global, were tied to many dimensions of health and well being, um, from depression to lower rates of suicide, anxiety, lower psychosis, less drug and alcohol use, and even longer life expectancy. And this, these findings were difficult to refute, just the, the mass of these findings. And Koenig has since updated his handbook in 2012 and has another one about to come out, but the results are the same. And this was difficult for skeptical scientists to ignore. And it set the stage for a second wave of research, starting in, I'd say, about the 1970s, just when I was starting to do some work in this area. And researchers began to look at what are the key ingredients of religious life. That's the second wave. And I was really involved in this, this change. I kind of saw it. In 1975, when I first began my work in this field, I used to be able to stay current by going to the library once a semester for a day and bringing along a bologna sandwich. This isn't the original one, but it represents my sandwich and reviewing journal articles. That's all it took, you know, one, one day a semester. But in the past 50 years, research in the area of religion has really increased. Uh, you can see here the sharp increase in the number of psych info searches on the term religion. And actually there's an even sharper rate of increase in the rate of searches for spirituality. And I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. But here I wanna stress that in this new wave of research, what was going on was I believe we were starting to take a closer look at religious life. And as researchers moved closer, it became clear that religion really is a complex, rich, multidimensional process. And one of the leaders of the field, Ralph Hood, said this. He said, religion may encompass the supernatural, the non-natural, theism, deism, atheism, monotheism, polytheism, all the theisms. And it may also include practice, belief, and rituals that almost defy circumscription and definition. And so to understand a phenomena as rich and complex, we would need to broaden and deepen the ways we conceptualize and measure it. So in this second wave of studies in the latter part of the 20th century, we saw efforts to bring and integrate mainstream theory into the psychology of religion. And so we saw efforts to bridge attachment theory, coping theory, cognitive theory, theories of emotion, motivational theory, evolutionary theory, terror management theory, and positive psychology into the field. And we also needed new measures of religiousness to assess these um, dimensions. So we had developed measures of attachment to God, religious coping, mystical experiences, quest, belief in afterlife, religious fundamentalism, religious locus of control. And this is just to name a few. Um, my friend and colleague Peter Hood, uh, Peter Hill, with Ralph Hood, have developed a developed a Measures of Religious Life book, very thick, in 1999. They're now upgrading it, and it's even thicker. So lots and lots of measurement. But maybe the most striking development in the latter part of the 20th century, and it continues to reverberate today, is the emergence of the term spirituality. So I have to say a few words about that. I think this development reflected a sense that something was missing in our scientific approach to religion. Um, something was missing. We weren't capturing the heart and soul of what religion is about. Where was the yearning for something sacred? Where was the experience of uplift, awe? Where were the feelings of divine connection? Where were the virtues that are rooted in the religious world, forgiveness, gratitude, humility? Where were the feelings of, of, of um, again, uplift? And how could we wrap our heads around the new religious expressions that were emerging? 
Eastern religions, Native American religions, feminist religions, and so on. The rise of alternative practices such as meditation and yoga and broader understandings of what people hold sacred from the environment um, to the arts, to the virtues, to our ultimate purposes of living, to work. I think these new expressions reflected a really a deep hunger for a revitalization, an injection of new spirit into our understanding of religious life. And in some sense, I think that injection of spirituality into the field, and we now call the psychology of religion, the psychology of religion and spirituality, the division that deals with it in the American Psychological Association has in fact changed its name from psychology of religion to psychology of religion and spirituality. And it reflects, I think, an openness to new groups and new practices and new beliefs. And it also represents a deepening of the field by zeroing in on the heart and soul of spirituality and what it means to be human. The most basic motivations, including spirituality and the yearning for a relationship with something sacred that really can't be reduced or explained away as something else. Core emotions, such as awe and uplift. Core experiences, such as the sense of transcendence and sacred moments or feeling that you're in, in touch with someone who's died or the spirit of a loved one. And core capacities, such as the capacity for virtues and goodness. Now, this shift in meanings is not without problems, and I'm one who's written actually quite a bit about the polarization of spirituality and religion and critically, but it has added and, and strengthened, I think, the, the uh, amount of energy has gone into the field. What's happened is we've seen now a dramatic increase in study. Um, and there goes my bologna sandwich. Gone was a, a time where I could just stay current in one day. No way. There's now a large and rich literature in the field, and we're no longer starting from ground zero. The second wave of work did more than just increase our understanding uh, and, it, and the key ingredients of religion and spirituality. The findings had practical implications. And this is leading us to wave three. Oops. For instance, if turning to religion as a resource to people is helpful, then why shouldn't we be encouraging people to draw on spirituality and religious resources? If experiences of transcendence foster greater well-being, why don't we explore ways to foster transcendence among those interested? If the virtues such as gratitude and forgiveness are linked to a more satisfying and meaningful life, why not try to promote them? And today we're seeing the beginnings of this third wave in which research and practice are becoming integrated. And the work that you're doing is a wonderful model for that integration. It's still relatively new uh, because of the anti-religious bias in the field and lack of knowledge, the topic of religion and spirituality uh, has not often been broached in practice. But I think the findings from wave two research are really compelling and they're uh, representing a body of knowledge that's ripe for application. So we see this third wave building. In 2013, I was fortunate to be able to uh, edit the APA Handbook of Psychology, Religion, and Spirituality. And in talking to APA, I told them that we really couldn't do justice to the field in only one volume. So APA led us to two volumes. Of course, they cost a fortune. And that's the downside. Um, but they acknowledge the evolution in the field. The overarching theme is integration of research and practice. The first volume focused on empirical research with an eye towards practical implications. The second volume focused on presentations of evidence-based applications in the field. And we filled up both handbooks. We've also seen a number of uh, recent books on the integration of religion and spirituality into practice, as well as centers and initiatives that encourage evidence-based practice in this domain, including the uh, LIFE initiative that's, that uh, Brett Smith and others 
have been putting together. Um, I should mention, I just returned from really an exciting meeting on uh, the, the uh, Science of Religious and Spiritual Exercises, that's SOURCE, uh, funded by the Templeton World uh, Charity Foundation. And it, it brought together experts in website design and apps, um, religious leaders and psychologists, sociologists, economists. We were all together collaborating on ways to develop and evaluate religious applications that come from different religious traditions. And these range from, they're just a fascinating array from prayer and meditation to fasting, to practicing the Sabbath, um, to following a Ramadan. So initiatives like this go beyond the clinical context. And, and the goal here is wide dissemination internationally of these practices to everyday people. So what, what I'd like to talk about now are some wave two findings that are um, ripe for wave three, practical application. Um, one of, and I, I should, um, I'll be really interested in, in your thoughts on this uh, and how they apply to uh, faith and entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm also interested in how um, these findings that have focused largely on well-being as the criterion, how would they apply to uh, work-related criteria such as um, creativity, uh, uh, life satisfaction, meaning at work, uh, productivity, maybe even profitability. On the resource side, it's clear that many people turn to religion as a resource in dark periods. I, this is a uh, slide describing the number of Google searches for the word prayer in the year 2020 across 80 countries. And you can see the number of searches prior to the reality that COVID was hitting in March of 2020. Then look what happens dramatic increase. And it illustrates the point that many people in difficult times look to their faith for source of support. And in fact, these resources are helpful. In a meta-analysis of over 103 studies of stress-related growth, positive religious coping resources represented the strongest predictor of stress-related growth among all the other predictors in the study. And this is where I've done much of my own research on positive religious coping, trying to identify what is it about religious coping that supports the individual. Um, I'm just going to give you an example of one positive religious coping resource, and that's uh, spiritual support. One type of spiritual support is support through empowerment. And you may not often think about it, but many people find themselves strengthened and empowered by their faith. One woman with HIV said, I'm speaking to my higher power, my God, and give thanks to that power. It's been a source of strength, you know. It's like tapping into some sort of power source that I can recharge my batteries. Research studies have shown that this type of empowerment is not at all uncommon, and it's associated with, with well-being. On the flip side, another kind of spiritual support can encourage um, active spiritual surrender. And I need to put that this kind of support in the context of uh, the larger context of Western culture. We, we live in a mastery oriented culture. Um, this is the culture where we face and solve problems. Uh, we do all we can to master the environment we try to extend the length of our lives and enhance the quality of our lives. And it's all great. But in spite of these efforts, we remain frail and finite beings. We can exert only so much control. And no matter how hard we try to care for ourselves, we will all eventually die. Now, religion provides a corrective to the assumption that we can solve and master all problems. Active spiritual surrender in particular offers a way to come to terms with limitations by handing over responsibility to the young, for the uncontrollable to a benevolent force, namely God. Here's an example 
Another woman coping with her HIV status says, I pray a lot. I gave it to God because I couldn't deal with it. It was too stressful for me. And it was like a load had been lifted off of me. I didn't have to worry about it because I knew it was in God's hands. So here I hope you can get a sense of that, that surrender, that letting go. And again, this type of surrender seems to be very helpful to people. And a third type of spiritual support is support through comfort. And let me illustrate this, this uh, through one empirical study um, that I did with one of my wonderful former graduate students, Amy Wachholst. Amy got her master's in divinity from Boston University, and she came to Bowling Green really interested in meditation. And she wondered whether in disconnecting meditation from its religious roots, after all, we, we frequently hear the mantra that you don't have to be religious to meditate, but, but maybe in disconnecting it from those roots, some of its power has been diminished. So she proposed a very simple but powerful study. She decided to test whether an explicitly spiritual meditation would be more helpful to other forms of meditation and she worked with one form of pain, vascular headaches. So we randomly assigned college students suffering from chronic headaches to one of four treatment groups, a spiritual meditation group that meditated to a phrase, God is peace or God is joy, an internally focused meditation that focused on, I am content, I am joyful, an externally focused meditation Grass is green, sand is soft. So they're all equal length, uh, the, and they all have a positive kind of, certainly positive uh, um, connotation. And then a progressive muscle relaxation group. And she had them practice the technique 20 minutes a day for four weeks and change, assess changes in, in uh, headache frequency and pain tolerance and so on. Well, what did she find? I mean, I was a little skeptical myself because after all, the only difference was in the phrase. And as long as you're meditating to a positive phrase, wouldn't that do the trick? Certainly that's what major meditation writers have suggested. What she found in looking at the number of uh, frequency of headaches over time in diaries was that the spiritual meditation group, this solid red line, spiritual meditators experienced a sharper decline in the frequency of headaches over the month. It was a striking finding. In terms of pain tolerance measured through the cold presser task where you stick your hand in ice water to see how long you would keep it in. Uh, I often thought of it as also a measure of poor judgment that any research participant would willingly stick their hand in ice water, but they did it. And here's what we found. Look at the solid red line. The spiritual meditators meditated, uh, um, were able to tolerate the pain twice as long. Um, really a striking finding. And a later study showed that those in a spiritual meditation group also make less use of analgesics to control their pain. A really important finding given the, the use of over-medication among people dealing with chronic pain. Now, remember, the only difference in the groups was the content of the meditative phrase. So this was important, and the findings suggested that content counts and that the spiritual element of meditation magnifies the effect of the meditation. And it suggests that, that pain could be reduced through a simple uh, spiritual practice. And it also suggests that when we disconnect spirituality and spiritual practices, from the field, we may be losing a vital ingredient. And, and I was, as I was reviewing this for this talk, I wondered whether there would be a place for teaching meditative, uh, prayerful or reflective methods at work that include those involving a caring relationship with God for those who believe in God, which is most of the people we know and work with. That's just one example of a positive coping resource, but I hope it illustrates the potential for these resources in, in work and in work settings. So let me shift here to consider a potentially more problematic side, spiritual struggles. As Brett mentioned, um, I've written a book with Julie on this topic. So if you wanna take a deeper look, 
Um, feel free to read that. That's my only plug. Even though spirituality is quite resilient, um, there are times when we encounter stressors that shake us to the core. Our deepest beliefs, our most important relationships, our sense of who we are, our sense of connection with the sacred itself. And when that happens, the ground that we stand on is no longer stable or steady. And in times such as these, I think we experience spiritual struggles. Spiritual struggles have been defined by Julie and I, uh, Julie Exline and I, as experiences of tension, strain, and conflict about sacred matters. And they may take, they may appear with the supernatural, within oneself, or with others. Uh, Julie Exline and I, we identified and measured seven specific forms of spiritual struggle, and it's a published measure now. And uh, you can find it through my book, or you can email me. Uh, it's, it's available to anyone. And these seven, uh, these six types of struggles. Oh, wait, let me. I wanted to give you this example. Here, here's an example of a struggle. And it came from an undergraduate in my psych of religion class who emailed this to me. She had bipolar illness. She wrote, I'm suffering, really suffering. My illness is tearing me down. And I'm angry at God for not rescuing me. I mean, really setting me free from my mental bondage. I've been dealing with these issues for 10 years now, and I'm only 24. I don't understand why he keeps lifting me up just to let me come crashing down again. So I hope you can hear in these words that kind of wrestling with God feeling that she's conveying. And um, clearly it has a lot of power for her. In fact, she later told me she'd been suicidal. Uh, so this is, this is really potent. Here are some different types of struggle. Divine struggles, and this student was experiencing a divine struggle. And they can involve feelings of anger to God, feeling punished by God, or feeling abandoned by God. Moral struggles. These are struggles within oneself that involve conflicts between one's impulses and one's spiritual and moral values and ideals. Doubt-related struggles over fundamental religious beliefs. Interpersonal struggles involving tensions and conflicts with other people in religious institutions over spiritual matters. Struggles with the demonic and evil forces. Um, when we first were writing about and researching this, some of our journal editors didn't want us to include demonic struggles. They didn't believe they were frequent enough or real. And boy, were they off base because they are not uncommon. They're actually normative within uh, many religious groups. And they also have power in people's lives when people are feeling like they've been attacked by or captured by the devil or evil forces. And then we have struggles of ultimate meaning about whether life in general and your life in particular have a deeper value and meaning. Now, I want to stress, oh, so uh, our factor analytic work did um, identify these six struggles, and they have been replicated. These aren't the only struggles. We believe there are others as well, but we think these are, are um, the, some of the most common. Another type of struggle that I might like to see us focus on would be struggles about life after death, um, but that's for other people doing research. I want to stress that in many studies, these struggles are not um, rare. They're not infrequent. In fact, they're commonplace. Uh, in our sample with several thousand US adults, we found that 70% reported struggles at some point in their lives, and a third to a half reported struggles in the last few weeks. Um, we've now done research across faith groups and found that struggles are commonplace among every religion that we've worked with. But I also want to note that um, struggles can also be found among atheists. So in, in a study that my wonderful former grad student, Aaron Sedlar did, we found relatively high levels of ultimate meaning struggles and interpersonal religious struggles and moral struggles among atheists. And I should say these struggles can be found among every 
demographic group. Uh, the group that seems to be uh, where struggles are most prevalent appears to be uh, young adults around adolescence and emerging adulthood, but also specific groups, minorities, um, and LGB LGBTQ population also. So, um, do they have any impact on our well being? Well, literally hundreds of studies have now been done on this topic. And uh, rather than review that in any detail here, I'll just um, note that these, these findings are robust. Spiritual struggles have been tied to poor mental health, poor physical health, and increased risk of dying, uh, declines in the immune system, poor self-regulation, such as drug and alcohol use, uh, eating disorders. And interestingly, too, struggles often precede religious disengagement. People don't go from being religious to non-religious. They usually have a period of struggle in between. Let me just take a look at one particular kind of struggle um, and some of its implications maybe for integration. And let's talk about struggles of ultimate meaning. Uh, in his uh, imprisonment in a concentration camp in, in World War II, psychiatrist Viktor Frankl concluded from his observations that people who have a why to live for can deal with almost any how. He's saying that meaning in life is, is really critical to our lives. And on the other hand, when we struggle to find that meaning or decide our lives are meaningless, we become vulnerable to emptiness, hopelessness, and despair, as many studies. <laughs> Um, someone's got their mic on, I believe. Okay. But we can resolve spiritual struggles by finding deep meaning and sacredness in our lives, in particular aspects of our lives. In one study, we found, we asked people to describe their strivings or their goals for living and the degree to which we held them sacred. And we found that people who held sacred strivings they were more invested in those, they invested more thought in them, more time in pursuing them, and more energy into those strivings. They also derived greater meaning and satisfaction from sacred strivings. So just let me make the point here that work too can be sanctified. Um, a job can take on a deeper meaning and purpose, and when it does, it becomes a calling or a vocation. Um, it takes what Brett Smith has called a, a theological turn. I love that phrase. It's a turn that can shift the focus exclusively from profit to other goals. And I'm going to, I don't mean to embarrass you, Brett, but I'm going to put your quote up here. Brett says religion likely relates to entrepreneurs um, setting goals that are not just related to self serving ideals or profit maximization but also to the pursuit of a higher calling or purpose related to one's religion, such as doing good and helping others, showing compassion, sharing wealth, and incorporating a day of rest. So the question I have for you is, how might you help people find a deeper, even sacred meaning uh, to entrepreneurial work? So I've highlighted some of the research that points to the double-sided nature of religion. And one of the questions I've been grappling with is, well, what determines whether religion serves as a resource or a source of problems? I don't think there's a simple answer, um, but I think it has to do with the degree to which we live well integrated or whole lives. So I just want to spend a few minutes briefly talking about wholeness and its key ingredients. And I think wholeness is a concept, a pretty new one, that has implications for entrepreneurship. Wholeness is a um, religiously based concept. Uh, the term wholeness and holiness actually have a common linguistic root. And the notion that we're broken is fundamental to the world's great religious traditions. And each offers an antidote to brokenness that in some ways or another includes this movement towards greater wholeness. Wholeness is also a potential. It's, um, I think, 
a potential or capacity that can be nurtured or neglected. I don't believe, as some writers in the area suggest, that we all are born whole. And we just need to learn how to free up that wholeness. I think it's a potential and that we really need to engage in this lifelong developmental task of growing and accessing our capacity for wholeness. And finally, wholeness is a master virtue. To me, it's the overarching goal we can strive for. It can direct all of our thoughts and actions and emotions and relationships into a coherent map for our lives. How do we become more whole? So let me just briefly note a few ingredients of wholeness. It involves the capacity to affirm life, to invest it with compassion and hope and support. Um, and here, um, I want to stress that life affirmation doesn't deny the reality of darkness. It just says it doesn't have the, the final say on life. There's also hope for a better tomorrow, and that's just as real. And there's plenty of support for that notion and the value of life affirmation. And we find that um, presented in every major religious tradition, uh, the promise of salvation in Christianity, the hope in repairing a broken world in Judaism, the attainment of enlightenment in, in Buddhism. And I don't mean to short shrift any other religious tradition because we can also find it in uh, Islam, we can find it in Hinduism and so on. <clears throat> Here's another example that I, I found really helpful in my own clinical work. Um, and it comes from the Japanese art form of kintsugi. Kintsugi means golden joining. And it offers a beautiful way to, to envision brokenness in a life-affirming way. And in effect, it, in fact, it, it reflects Shinto, Buddhist, and Confucian thought. It, what it, it involves is the preservation of um, broken ceramic pieces. So you break a piece of ceramic, and then you put it together again using golden or silver filigree. And these bonds highlight rather than conceal the brokenness in the reformed object. So through kintsugi, wholeness is literally created out of brokenness. And the result is a new work of art. And you could say, and I believe it's more beautiful than the original unblemished work. Uh, this is a very hopeful metaphor for people who feel broken, who may feel un irrevocably broken, to say that your brokenness may be just setting the stage for a greater wholeness, and we can work together to build that wholeness. Putting the pieces of our lives together is like creating a work of art. Uh, and sometimes it's something more beautiful and precious than what we started with. So I wonder, within the context of work and constant pressures and stresses and daily demands that, that can push for seemingly unrelenting worry and anxiety, um, how do you foster and encourage a life-affirming perspective? I mean, it's a, it's a question I have, and I, I, I wonder about it and your thoughts on it. Another ingredient of wholeness is the capacity to balance, which is always a work in progress. I mean, we're always thrown, even when we contain balance, the shifting winds of our lives can throw us off. Um, and finding balance is a, is a challenge <laughs> of, of blending or integrating what can be competing, um, competing goals and values, uh, being self-centered versus other-centered being active versus passive, being reason-oriented reason or intuition-oriented, focusing on immediate versus delay of gratification. Uh, I, I might add bridging the desire for profit with the desire to contribute to a better world. How do we find a balance between these different values, these different, in some ways, virtues? And finally, I want to mention the ability to accept paradox. Um, it's a critical aspect of wholeness. And ours is an age of puzzle and paradox. Uh, even the notion of truth has been challenged. Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, Niels Bohr said that the opposite of a correct statement is a false statement. 
But the opposite of a profound truth may be another profound truth. So incongruity and paradox are a part of our lives. Um, we're made up of contradictory thoughts and feelings and emotions, and some of them are not even aware of it. But simultaneously, we can love and hate, seek isolation and closeness. We can pursue pleasures inconsistent with our deepest values and so on. It's not the way we usually see ourselves as paradoxical, um, contradictory beings. And yet, I think wholeness calls for that ability not to eliminate, but to recognize incongruities and multiple choice, multiple truths. And we can look to the wisdom traditions for help here too. Um, this br br brings to mind one of my favorite stories. Uh, it's a story of two Jews who seek out a rabbi traveling with his wife. Uh, and the, the two Jews are trying to help uh, get his advice on resolving a conflict. So the first man, when he finishes making his case, the rabbi ponders, and he says, you are right. The second man makes his argument, and the rabbi ponders, and the rabbi says, you are right. The wife of the rabbi, she's perplexed by her husband's responses, and she says, how can they both be right? And the rabbi responds, you are also right. I've covered a lot of territory here, and I hope you see that there's a deep and robust empirical literature on religion and spirituality, and that we're really no longer starting from scratch, as, as Brett said in the introduction. Um, so I, I look forward to the advances you are making and will continue to make integrating this literature into the domains of faith and entrepreneurship. Ken, thanks very much. I, I really appreciate the, the broad uh, amount of content that you shared with us. Uh, you know, most people can't integrate both a bologna sandwich and divine struggles for ultimate meaning, but you've managed to capture that and, and, and much, much more. So uh, th there were a couple of questions in the chat. The, the one question that, that we've wrestled with in our, in our own research is um, this expansion of religion to, to include spirituality that you talked about. Uh, but could you talk about some of the challenges of trying to navigate that or trying to signal that as as you work through the publication and the specificity of what it is that you're that you're researching? So any um, any guidelines to scholars as they step into this space or continue to work in this space about how to navigate the religion spirituality um, breadth? Yeah, great question and. Um... I didn't get into that because that would have taken a long time, but let me just briefly note that part of the problem is definitional. And it's really, um, my great friend and colleague, Bernie Spilka, once said that, um, that spirituality is a muddled concept. And I, I think when he was writing, that was really true. Um, it wasn't clear what it really was all about. It didn't have definite parameters. Well, I think some progress has been made there. Um, now we think about um, spirituality as the search for the sacred, what people do to find, hold on to, and transform a relationship to whatever the deepest uh, source of connection and meaning in their life might be. Now that spiritual search can occur within a, a religious framework. It can occur within an institutional religious framework with its established beliefs and practices and institutional structure. And so um, even though we often hear that you don't have to be spiritual to be religious, I mean, you don't have to be religious to be spiritual, which is true, most people in the United States are both spiritual and religious. Most people place their spirituality in an organized religious context, but it's also the case that we're seeing a growing number of people who see themselves spiritual only and who have left a religious institutional context to live out their spiritual beliefs and practices that may take many, many forms. So the definition has been, it has been I think, becoming more clarified. The other challenge in it is, and I'll just briefly mention this, is that the terms have for a long time now been polarized. Religion has been kind of polarized to become the dogma um, dark construct. 
in const in, and um, that that restricts and binds. Spirituality has been contrasted as the the construct that frees, that's open, that enhances, and I think that's a really unfortunate uh, polarization. Again, because spirituality occurs within a religious context, and we can find both helpful and harmful forms of religiousness and spirituality. They're not good guys and bad guys. They're both richer and more complex than that. So when you're starting to navigate this area, you need to have that kind of context in mind. And, and if you're interested, we do have some chapters in it in the handbook, the APA handbook on the meanings of the constructs and some of the challenges in it. Yeah, su super helpful. There's, there's a question from, from Russ Browder that, that's, what research do you see being done on how religion spirituality relates to decision making and how humans choose to what to do when facing uncertainty? So any any thoughts you can point us to there? Yeah, um, it's a great area for growth. Um, I, I did a little bit myself when um, a number of years ago with uh, Michael Doherty and Bill Balzer, who are experts in decision making work, and we use the Brunswickian lens model approach to look at how um, actually what we looked at was related to your question, Brett, was we looked at um, how people decide whether or not they're religious or spiritual. What kinds of criteria did they use to decide if they're religious or spiritual? And we found some really important differences in that. But I think we could do the same thing using that kind of decision-making framework. And I like the lens model because it's a very rich approach that allows for both uh, nomological and um, and ideographic kinds of research methods, looking at uh, different aspects of religion as they predict decisions around, say, um, abortion, decisions around um, how you treat gays and lesbians, I mean, really sensitive types of issues. So trying to figure out what aspects of religiousness and spirituality are predictive of important decisions in life not just whether you're religious or spiritual, but what aspects, dig deeper, what are the critical ingredients? And I think that can be applied to a, a decision-making framework. Well, Andy, you want to ask one final question and then we'll, we'll wrap up this part. Yeah, we have one, we had one question come in, um, said entrepreneurship is often a long journey with few peaks and many valleys. How can religion or faith and its open and explicit relationship with human struggle inspire or inform the way we think about entrepreneurship, especially in the struggles that come with it? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, uh, really important question. And I can't give you any easy answer to that. What I've presented is a kind of spiritual or religious and spiritual orientation, a description of how the religious and spiritual orientation can help you move through many aspects of life, life as a whole, but also things like entrepreneurship and your work, how might you draw on specific spiritual religious resources to help sustain you when you do face the challenges, the questions, the conflicts, and the, the notion of comfort's just one, uh, one religious resource. There are other religious resources too. One is about all about, for instance, reframing uh, negative events in a more positive, benevolent, ultimate context, which I think is, is real helpful of being able to see your challenges in the, no, in the light of the notion and language of challenge and in a hopeful con context that can help sustain you as you're going through tough times. The struggles work, I think is important because um, we, I really like the struggles language because struggle has potential built into it. We struggle not only with something challenging, but to attain something of value and meaning. And in struggle, they're a fork in the road. Struggles can lead to um, decline, and a lot of research shows that, but they also have the potential for life transformation. And through struggle, we can broaden and deepen our perspective. We can develop stronger skills. We can shift our, our sense of what's really important and meaningful. And all of that applies, and I'm just being quite general here, I think, to entrepreneurship. But and again, you're talking to a clinical psychologist who's, who's worked with most, the context for me is psychotherapy, but I think there might be some relevance to it. I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Ken, thank you. First off, uh, we super appreciate you being with us today and sharing your, your wealth of experience in this space um, to give us a, a number of different things to think about, not just the struggles, but also about the positive religious coping, I think has, has great relevance to, to a lot of the work, meaning making. There's just, there's just a wealth in there. So uh, on behalf of uh, all of the attendees, we want to say thank you for, uh, for coming to be with us today. Thank you. And I wish you all well in your day today. Thanks. Appreciate it.